do the, the sort of the retail component of the of the downtown. He indicated that he couldn't possibly do this alone. This this is the there's a the major major dividing street in San Diego is Broadway, which is the uppermost street in both the right and left hand slide, and it's the kind of DMZ. On the left is sort of civilized life. On the right was uh, uh, just a sort of a burnt out zone of porno shops. Uh, the, the Navy used to populate the entire waterfront of San Diego, and this is really the kind of stuff that kept the Navy going uh, on shore. <laughs> and the Navy moved out of town, and so there they sat with this, this, this kind of neither here nor there place, and it was a, a absolutely perfect place for redevelopment to occur, so the object was to do this thing. Now, San Diego is, you know, l literally paradise in, by the measure of Southern California with surfing and barbecues and all the kind of stuff that people do. So to get anybody to come to the downtown was thought of as being an unbelievably, almost impossible chore. And that whatever this beast was that we were going to create, it had to have such extraordinary sort of attractiveness to do this, to do this job of pulling people out of the suburbs and back into the downtown. We had a, a fabulous audience. We have the in-city captive downtowner. There are residents down there. There are, there are people that commute in to go to work. Um, then there's a tourist population that's very exciting. There is a, uh, a, the, then the new suburban issue. There's the, the, a new light rail that connects us to Mexico. So we had this great layering audience that was to be dealt with. I guess that's the other thing about all of our work. There's no way to make this stuff avant-garde. I mean, it is populist by definition. You know, that's the, the audience that we have. And I, and I have a funny feeling that, that there's a great validity in that. Uh, you have no idea of the sophistication of the average guy uh, in terms of his knowledge about and sensitivity about places and events and environments and can discern the difference between good and bad. Uh, and that sort of crept up on a lot of people, uh, not realizing that that had gone on. So that there, you know, you're really dealing with a, a very sophisticated animal, I think, when you're dealing with the populist problem, the mob. And um, so that's, what this, that's the, the, the focus for all of this. Project's components are a 500-room hotel, four about 150,000-foot department stores, 800,000 feet of sort of conventional retailing, 80,000 feet of specialty shopping, an 800-seat repertory theater, uh, 300,000 feet of garden office, uh, a marketplace, um, a theater district, a children's district, and all that sort of business. What's open is just phase one. And phase one is the three levels of retail and marketplace. And what's yet to come is, as you see on the model, that's the model that no one was impressed with on the right. Uh, all that stuff that you see is actually we convinced them that a high-rise office building would be much less interesting than a low-rise field just scattered across the entire top of the project. So that's the next element to come. Then the office market in San Diego isn't um, s tough enough right now to, s to suggest that they can go in and develop it. So it will probably happen in a few years, we hope. The uh, project was, was the creation of re in, by redevelopment process, so it's the red on the right-hand slide, and then you can sort of identify it sitting in the upper right-hand side. And it's always been uh, the beginning of an avenue, a pedestrian boulevard that will drive itself from the financial district, which is right at the upper end of the red, all the way down to the waterfront, which you see over in the left. Now that Horton's open, we're now working on the next block on that grabbing, in effect, the red diagonal coming out. Uh, and we're assured that the next two blocks will be completed, so we will have this very important new sort of urban mark uh, that, that coalesces this 40 acres of new in-city residential that's occurring uh, all around that red line. The new convention center is not shown correctly in this drawing, but it would be sort of at the bottom uh, of the left-hand slide uh, in a direct line down from Horton. So there's another new axis that will be coming down from there, which will, which will skewer together to, uh, the hotels and, and uh, the other elements that will generally coalesce around the, the uh, convention center. Um, the, the doing of this project was really a, uh, it was very hard, I mean, it really was, because I wasn't sure, nobody was sure of what was right and what was wrong, and I don't even know that what we've done is right, except that it was very righteous as an experiment, and what we're getting back in terms of early feedback is that it's working in spades, so, uh, and you really have to try these things out to see if they work, it, you know, it's a $140 million project, uh, and you hope like hell it works. <laughs> But what we felt was that what it should be is not foreign to the city, but at the same time be foreign to the city. And so we, we tried to draw upon all the elements that, are, that make up San Diego. And I think that, again, we Californians, those of us that live here all the time and sort of pay attention, this, this pluralist sort of wacky eccentricity of the many, many 
kinds of architectures that all sort of blend together it makes sense to us. It, it actually really works. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to a guy from Boston. Uh, and San Diego is, is really that. I mean, that's what it is. It's this unbelievable collage of things from, uh, you know, Churgueresque Spanish Revival churches all the way up to uh, modern Art Deco buildings up to very bad contemporary curtain wall buildings and everything in between. And it all sort of pulls together. San Diego has one of these extraordinary light qualities. It's the thing that, that LA used to have, this unbelievable glowing light quality. And the city has, be, has, has spawned a, uh, a set of colors that are sort of uniquely there, brick, bricks and grays and peaches and mauves and all this that are sort of in the old buildings and in the new buildings so that they, and that it, it is powerfully evident as you move through the city. The city was also tower crazy. There were towers on everything, the, the railway station, the uh, uh, Old Town, the Balboa Park area, the Coronado Theater, the actual fountain at, er, at Horton Plaza Park, uh, the Cortez Hotel, all of these things, and the towers sort of turned on with these things, and we said that they would be a great uh, method of, of sort of punctuating the landscape to find your way around this new project, using towers as the identity devices for key elements of the city. We also looked at the, the is it, there's some more of them, that's the Balboa Theater on the left, the, uh, the, uh, the Gilf Fountain on the right, and then one of the towers in the project on the right. Uh, the, 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 this, the, the sort of the colorfulness of it and the, and the um, the very flat facadedness of the whole thing. So we thought we could capture all of this and sort of reconstruct it in the form of a zone of the city. This was never, in our minds, thought of as a, as a project or as a building, but rather as a zone of the city, like the Plaka is to Athens or Westwood is to Los Angeles, so that it was, a, it was certainly a, a poly place, and many, many parts that would make it up. Um, and that it should have its own sort of uniqueness by virtue I think in our case here, a somewhat eccentric sort of posture. On the other hand, it should be familiar to the city. Um, how we got there, I beat, beats the hell out of me. Uh, Mark, <laughs> let me see, that starts the, the Olympics show. Huh. I'm baffled, let me just sort of travel along here and see what happens. Okay, that's it, they're changing the thing, sorry. They're going to change, change uh, uh, grids. I think that this idea of this incredible opportunity that exists here in Southern California has to do with this place, this lack of place that we, we all seem to sense, this, uh, this sort of open-minded attitude about trying things out. And uh, you know, if it has a spiritual center, it probably hovers somewhere between here and Tokyo. It is less aligned with the rest of the American continent and more aligned with a lot of other things, which means that there's this incredible opportunity um, and, and lack of, of sort of cultural restraint in order to, to sort of tackle uh, the problems of the suburbs and the recreation of cities. And I think there's a spirit of, uh, of um, I think, you know, in the, the younger architects and their work, the, the, a lot of the teachers here, I mean, there's this incredible sense of, of daring, and yet when it's all over with, in my eyes, an incredible sense of fittedness that seems to work. Um, that is, that gives us an unusual opportunity, I think, to, uh, to, um, to go on. Is, can I go ahead? Yeah, there we go. I, I, what those middle slides were, I have no idea, but we'll sort of move on. This is Horton Plaza in, in a generalized sort of the levels of it. And in effect, the, the, the grid is, as I said, is a thing that we have loved to take on in a sort of an unusual way and to tweak it. Uh, the inter introduction of a curving element in the grid is, uh, is something that I'm fascinated by. So we created, in effect, this multi-level diagonal street system that runs through the city uh, from, in this case now, on the lower right, the downtown, and on the upper left, the, uh, the, fin the new residential district, and then eventually the waterfront. Uh, you see, actually, that the big blocks are department stores, the little blocks are small stores. Um, here we've just switched axes on you. On the right hand side you see the little pinkish things, squares and triangles and whatnot. Those are the towers or the sort of articulated catalog elements. The tower building, the triangular palazzo building, the long red thing is the, the Galleria building which becomes a ruin as it moves to the lower left and degrades into the finally the tower of the, the lower department store. Uh, we created sort of the main sweeping uh, big urban moves and then populated them with these smaller subset uh, architectures to, to zone it into a whole series of smaller subset districts. 
It isn't, it, you know, we're, I'm going to, uh, by the way, this whole presentation is going to break down into just some pretty pictures in a minute. The, pro the project is, is uh, very new, and so we, we really don't have an intelligent set of photographs that you get you through it. So these are just photographer's delights, and I'll try to point out some of the things that would go along. But it is not a project that, to be photographed. It's really a project to be experienced, and that's what it's all about, is going there and walking in it and being in it. So it, it in some cases, may look even chaotic in the pictures. But it, it, if anybody's interested, I'd suggest you go down and just walk it. Opening day was a grand event for many people. It was eight years of, of real anxiety to get because of the, the rules that were breaking in the project were extraordinary from everything from the way it was financed to the, what you ask people to do that have never done it before and investing enormous amounts of money into it, uh, the risk that the political people took and so forth. So that this, this moment in time for a lot of people was very, very exciting. I think that's an important note, by, by the way, by the firm, is that there's no way that what you've seen here is, is my work. This is the work of a, a lot of different people uh, in, in the doing of Horton uh, because of, of this feeling that it couldn't be the work of one hand. Uh, different people were assigned different projects. The Robinson's building was David Kofel. The, Gal the arcade building was Charlie Pig. The Triangular Palazzo building was Richard Orn. Um, Jim Campbell sort of did the artifacts and the, uh, and the smaller elements in the project. Bill DeEel uh, worked out all the grand geometries and the big, the big sort of melange of systems. Um, Eddie Wong ran the office. And so there are some very real human beings with very real and extraordinary talent that have coupled together to make all this kind of stuff happen. And it's very important to me that everybody else understand that, that it is not a person. It's a, it's a group of people uh, getting it all together. These are now just going to be pictures of, of Horton it, uh, around its opening. It opened only about 40% complete in the sense that most of the stores and so forth weren't there. But it is this urban experience of, uh, however, it, and funnily, you can go to parts of it and you say, I've been here before, and yet I've never been here before. I mean, it, it, it eludes a, a quick definition, but it, it is, a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a collage of pieces. It has had, it's received some unbelievably uh, tough criticism, uh, and it's received some really unbelievably good criticism. So, uh, and that's I, probably the measure of this kind of stuff, is if it was all of either or the other, you should really worry, but it, it has enough of both to, to make sense. Uh, I'll just go through these sort of quickly, and we're going to end up with some stuff on the Olympics. So these are just views of, that's Richard's building on the right, the stripe, the zebra looking thing, that's the Palazzo building, uh, influenced by uh, Italian Renaissance, you know, sort of flat planar graphics. The project was done very inexpensively. It's $60 a foot for the stuff that you're seeing, not including the parking costs. And, and so it was really a manipulation of stucco and, uh, you know, rather prosaic materials with the exception of some moments of more expensive stuff. But it, it, its qualities really come out of the atmospheric issues, the spatial issues, the sort of kinetics of people moving through it and that sort of thing. This is the Palazzo building with the little narrow street on one side, and the great arc is off to the left. The day and night change is pretty exciting. We did some, uh, some great art pieces that, uh, funnily, I never realized that they were all sort of pieces of e from Egypt, which is exactly what would, should happen in the city, is these artifacts. There's an obelisk that Joan Brown did. Peter Alexander did this light clock that produces, it's like the, the uh, Santa Ana alien harps. In this case, it celebrates a, a moment in the afternoon with refracting mirrors and tracking devices and a, an abstraction of the solar boat that was found under Ke the Pyramid of Cheops in the southern court. This is the Robinson story that Kofel did, and on the right, uh, the sort of dining court that Jim Campbell did. Uh, this was the influence of a little, a little narrow street off the Piazza San Marco in Venice. It's a magnificent little triangular building that uh, was recollected in the bigger building. Surface breakdown is quite obvious. That was derived from Italian Renaissance. Uh, this whole idea of destroying scale in a in a in a sort of a graphic way is is a thing we're really excited about. And working out many versions of on the right, I think, is Orvieto. Um, but it's a it has a, a very strong presence in the in the project itself. Deborah Sussman, uh, Susan Hancock, and Deborah Sussman's firm did the colors, uh, and there again, they are all colors that are found in and around the site, but tweaked slightly to give them this larger than life uh, quality. We're really hoping for two or three Santa Anas to blow through because it does have this sort of newness and it needs to, to sort of settle into the city. Um, putting it mildly, right? 
This is one of the towers, the Mervyn's building. Uh, identifies the Mervyn's that Richard Orne did. Uh, looking south, now all that air above the arch is the future office that will be coming up. Uh, pieces of the building. And these were all found. Uh, the, the building on the right, for instance, was there. That's the Knights of Pythias building. It was, con it was taken apart and then reconstructed, uh, saving all the ornament and, and, and tablature pieces and all that sort of thing. This is the transportation building that goes over from one side of the project to the other, uh, the Mervyn's Tower. This, that clock on the right has been in San Diego for over 100 years and uh, was a, a, a great spiritual act for the Jessup's family and company to bring the clock with them and install it so that in a way it was the, you know, the something old that helped sort of launch the project. Um, again, these are just these sort of photogenic things, at different pieces of, that's the arcade building on the left. Bullock's Tower in the arcade on the left. The staircase at Nordstrom's. The, tri the transportation building. The Joan Brown obelisk. And it, that rises out of a, a circular court that has the repertory theaters. The grand staircase that goes down into the marketplace at the south. Sort of overview of it. This, this blue metal frame is the uh, all the, the restaurant forecourt on the uppermost level at the south end. Okay, the last thing I'd like to share with you just is, is, is the same thing done in a temporary state, and that was the, the Olympics project, which attempted to, to transform, literally, the city for two weeks uh, into a festival uh, site. It was uh, 22 different sports venues and 150 cultural arts venues, uh, all of whom had a, a previous life either in the form of a stadium, just a small, you know, sort of anonymous building, in some cases vacant sites, a lake, the Pacific Ocean, uh, freeways, the convention center, and all of these things had to be transformed on a very low budget into, into uh, places of celebration. Uh, we were the, the very first consultant, I think, brought in, uh, and we we're, were commissioned first to just plan the UCLA, the U, yeah, the UCLA Village, and as we were in the midst of it, it dawned on us what was going on, talked to the uh, fellows that were running it and said that, you know, that, that they were probably going to try to get away without doing anything, just simply use uh, the minimum amount of materials that were necessary. And we convinced them that the world would be expecting something, uh, that you couldn't, happen, you couldn't have 900 miles of chain link, in spite of Frank Gary's genius, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And that we felt, however, by using this unbelievably cheap pallet of materials, essentially renting most everything and, and, and borrowing, you know, very banal stuff, clearly influenced by, uh, by Gary's work, by um, Judd Fine and all the people that have dealt with sort of the, the, the banal, um, that there was something exciting that could be done. They said, you were right, and then off we went. Uh, and eventually began with this idea of a catalog and slowly built this, this army of people up till we ended up in an old warehouse over on 8th Street near downtown where we had 160 people borrowed from different offices and, and hired on for about two years uh, producing, in effect, the parts. And then we, we made a relationship with a number of other outside design firms. So this is, again, the work of many, many people. John Alexich conjured up the images for the rented painting scaffold that was then decorated by Deborah Valencia of Deborah Sussman's office. Um, Mark Johnson and uh, Glenn Nordlow created all of the technology. And so those are all rented tents that are hopped up. We put on new sort of tops into the tent pieces. Uh, John Spore did. I'll, I'll point these things out as we go through. This is looking down. At, the project was one of, of vast urban planning. In other words, using the catalog of parts, we, we planned um, urbanistic events. Uh, uh, in this case, I think it's swimming, uh, where you have a forecourt and a ticketing area, then a great sort of concession zone. Uh, rented bleachers and scaffolding on the right hand side is Lake Acetas. Uh, we had a wonderful serendipity of one of the guys took a day off, went to the beach and met an Israeli balloon artist who claimed that he could produce these long, those are the stripes that you see out in the water, could, to, could do these, these miracle balloon tricks and they sent him off to Israel with a check thinking he'd never see him again and he came back with this huge boat full of, of appropriately colored balloon stock, and he decorated half the city with these things. Um, 
So this is the kind of stuff. This is uh, Victor Schumacher's uh, thing on Westwood Boulevard, uh, Wilshire Boulevard, as you go out of Westwood at the, the Veterans Cemetery. That's John Spore's dining pavilion tent at uh, Expo Park. Uh, and it all came off this catalog of pieces that were done. These are, again, these bar mitzvah tents sort of souped up on the top with sonotube uh, columns around the bottom and then these plywood skirts on, on very cheap uh, holocord doors to form this whole language of tent pieces that were first aid stations, VIP information, shopping centers, souvenirs, ticketing, telephones, all that kind of stuff. And each one sort of had its own encoded set of notions, uh, entrances, then all this whole uh, family of sonotubes, cardboard forms for, for concrete columns that were encoded with various uh, bars and stars and, and languages to do all sorts of jobs of creating entradas into sculptures, uh, creating surrounds around existing buildings, being used in parking lots as for identity, again being used for ticketing and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a signage program the Sussman uh, group worked out with uh, a number of other uh, graphic consultants. Um, a whole street banner program that was uh, uh, created to decorate all the freeways and the major boulevards. The whole Olympics uh, Arts Festival, which was a marvelous idea that the Sussman gang had about taking fragments of the things that would come in the, Oli in the, uh, in the athletic Olympics and then sticking the fragments in the sides of things, coming out of the top of the city hall and the sides of buildings and so forth to sort of herald the new, the new events. All of the little stuff, the award stands, the hurdles, the starting blocks, the ribbons that the medals hung on, all the goop, you know, the, the little things that make it up. On the right was the design guide, which attempted to inform sponsors, people that were going to sell whoopee cushions and all this other sort of stuff to, to somehow join the party with regard to the design theme of the deal. Uh, it's a complete signage program for the city and, and flip flag program. Um, the, the street decoration notion. The, the, one of the really exciting projects here was orchestrating how this stuff went into the city. As it, it, it began with the Fine Arts Festival and it began to develop this sort of surge of interest as it trying to get the city lit up. This is SC, uh, which was the... And the, the two villages are very different. Glenn Nordelow of our office did SC. Mark Johnson of our office did UCLA, and they had totally different qualities. SC was a, an Italian block party. It was a very dense, urban, between buildings and using streets kind of thing. UCLA was this great sort of spaceship that floated above the playing fields at uh, Drake Stadium. These are looking at views of the SC village. This was one of the, the two villages were really the, one of the highlights of the games, and of course nobody could get in and see them uh, because of the security and so forth. This was Main Street at SC which was a, a really a, a riot of events. A whole temporary uh, dining halls were created out of fabric uh, and, and, and uh, rented trailer uh, refrigerators and so forth. Um, scaffolding con concocted to form entrances, the entrances into the, the UCLA village, or USC village. The one out of the catalog called the wizard tent. It was just the sort of wild card in the project, the little purple thing on the left. Uh, the entrance gate to SC on the right. The uh, Barton Phelps, Mark Johnson uh, did the, the building of the scaffold city on top of Drake Stadium at UCLA. This had all the, the sort of communal events, the post office, the hair salons, the disco, the restaurants, the mail, all that kind of business. It was really a vibrant and exciting. Peter Shire did the nightclub, which is on the right, with these imag imaginary uh, great animals and uh, just completely um, baffled, you know, the, the basic system and did it in a most ex exciting way. This is the nightclub. Uh, the the poor temporary bus station down on the playing fields at UCLA. The night version was, even though there were a great deal of night events, was really extreme. This is John Spore's uh, Arca Systems, uh, the uh, main de dining tent at Expo Park. You can see the pavement painting. The paper, the, one of the great things about working on this thing was this unbelievable spirit that everybody had. Uh, Ellsworth Kelly would have died to have the guy that painted the parking lots at, at Expo Park. I mean, it was the corners were magnificent, mitered, unbelievable work. This was the uh, judging tower at Lake Casitas and the B B B Doran Gazette, the, the Israeli balloon guy on the right. Uh, Polly Pavilion, Martin Phelps on the left. Uh, the, the beginning of the UCLA village on the right. Victor Schumacher shooting. Uh, 
venue out in the desert. We, we spanned everything from the ocean to the mountains to lakes to the desert. This was the Prado Dam shooting uh, festival, Expo Park, Rose Garden, the Theme Tower by John Spore and Deborah Valencia. The Expo Park entrance, Gary's Space Museum through the archway. John Alexich, um, a really great architect, uh, conjured up the the basic prototype blocks for the for the uh, scaffolding towers that were then transformed by Sussman into these constructivist sort of images. It's you know everyone's always said that you know aren't you sad that there's nothing left. That, it's all gone, and that's not true. Every cheap plastering job in the city's got a magenta scaffold sitting in front of it. <laughs> this is um, archery. Uh, we, we learned a great deal about this, about transformation and about temporariness and about festival and celebration and so forth. And, and, uh, it, it, it really has informed us. We're finding in many, many places now we can use this much more fragile way of getting things, something started uh, you know, without having to commit to incredible early funds that can then trans, transform itself later into something else. That's just the, the quality of the pavement painting you see on the right. That's just a, an unbelievable intersection. These great pinatas that hung in the, in the uh, existing interior stadiums. We were de dealing with a series of audiences, the television camera, the actual spectator and then the, the sort of average Los Angelino. And each one had his own sort of peculiar point of view and each one had to be met. Uh, the, the incredible sort of rising to the occasion in Los Angeles was, was unexpected and really tremendous. These are the interior, everything was designed to have a camera take a picture of it so that it would, anytime you took a picture, you knew it was LA and it was 84. Weightlifting, uh, swimming on the right, a guy named Dan Stewart was uh, very important to the formation of the thing in the, within the committee. He was an architect who ran the construction division in the beginning. The, uh, one of the little shopping centers, the entrance to swimming, the tent village, entrances. Great sort of space making and atmospheric opportunities with these fabrics that we used as as shaded boulevards and arcades and courtyards and, and uh, some really terrific and much of it not planned, just sort of coincidental stuff that fell out as you would pull these things together. Then the, really the biggest challenge was the Coliseum because it was obliterated with coke and cigarette ads and all kinds of just junk that had been plastered over it so that what we did is built an, a, a liner out of plywood and cardboard that literally just slipped over the old Coliseum and left the scoreboard sticking up but devoid of any any advertising and so forth, and then, um, you know, that was it. So that's the show. Could you turn the lights on? Thank you. incredibly colorful. I felt right at home with the scaffolding and all in many of those shots. I think Mr. Jurdy would take questions if you'd like to spend a little time. Uh, he graciously consented to do that. Are there any questions? Never. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> There's one. I, I couldn't hear you. I think, yeah, I, I mean, energy, sun, uh, uh, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. I mean, in the sense that we are energy issues or sun orientation, solar, passive, heating, that kind of thing. Sure. I mean, that's that's obvious. Very little of our work is brand, we're, we're normally always working in a very little of it is done in the wilds, I and mean, we have very few raw sites. Most of them are working with older pre-existent sites and so forth, but I believe that we are, uh, you know, very sensitive to that kind of stuff. I'm not, uh, I'm not a um, pioneering ecolog ecologist uh, sort, though I don't think that we're doing anything extraordinary in that sense. 
Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, in the downtown Los Angeles area, there's really, uh, some, uh, in my opinion, there's a, a dichotomy that's been created between the, the Bowery area and the kind of high-tech uh, corporate high-rise uh, towers. And I was just wondering if you think that's an issue and if you've given any thought to how that, Oh, I really, yeah, I think it is. See, what you have is it's, it's embryonic. The downtown didn't exist at all 20 years ago. I mean, it was a totally burnt out place, and it had to have that sort of initial assault of money and activity in the form of these corporate towers that have come on that are very self-centered and self-sufficing. They're absolutely the middle step to make. And I think the next step now begins to create that intelligence between the various districts and parts of the city. There's a Bowery, there's a Skid Row, there's the Flower Mart, there's the CRA is very, you know, that's their whole reason to, for being, basically, is to begin now to knit these things together. Until you had something to knit, there was nothing to begin, but that's a great deal of energy is going into considerations now of, of providing, you know, because the, the, the indigent are very real people. They're very important people to a city, and they aren't to be just sort of eradicated, and uh, so they become very important in terms of the planning of the city and and, uh, and can, can in, the, in the long run be the make or break between the reality of a city because we all live in a kind of cosmetized city of everything looks pretty and there's nothing, there's nothing behind it. And the reality of great cities is that it has all of the stuff, you know, and so they're very important in, the, in planning theory and so forth. Yes? No? Are you Yes. <laughs> what did she say? It's <laughs> <laughs> Three times. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a real problem that exists with the pavilion right now, and that is that we took, we took as a found object an old parking garage that was behind the May Company, which is really dysfunctional. And so what that's done, it has pushed a lot of people outside of the project out into the community, which shouldn't happen. And so now they, that, has real, that realization by both the politicians and the owners has created a no, whole new restudy to enhance the garages to make them more functional with regard to holding people and I think it will have because it's having a very negative effect on the surrounding um, you know residential community the I think that is a problem you know this kind of a thing I mean that's a classic piece of strip development even though it's sort of gargantuan strip development is the lack of being able to consider in the larger context and I, I wouldn't be particularly proud of the um, you know of the sensitivity in that but that's something that was out of our control Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean that. Yeah, you bet. I think, and I, I think that that you know, Los Angeles, the traditional city's worry is how to make its downtown come alive. That's not the most of the people in this city don't even care about the downtown. They care about their district. They're, I mean, they're much more focused on that. Later on, they'll be. They will care a lot about the downtown. But I mean, one of the great things about Los Angeles is this unbelievable panoply of people. You know, the Koreans, the Hispanics, the Russians, the Lithuanians, the Italians, and they're all, many of them, in their identifiable areas. And they form cogent, uh, pattern-making, district-making sorts of, of groups. And I, they are really critical, I think, in the knowledge of them. Certainly, um, the, in the downtown, you know, you're surrounded by these very clear ethnic uh, groups. And the idea of maintaining venues for these people to express themselves, Pershing Square, that's the sociological mixing bowl, as far as we can tell. It's the place where all of these people can come together and have an individual expression as well as a communal sort of celebration. The Hispanic effect on Los Angeles, which is, we have no idea what that's, I mean, you and I have no idea what that's going to be like. It's going to really transform the city, and in my guess, into a, in a much more magical place than we have now. And you, ha you very clearly have to think about those ethnic stratas and, and, the, and the preservation of them as well as the communal enhancement of them in the collective sense.
I think it's much more natural to have these very Yeah, I agree with you. I think it becomes contrived in the, in the manner in which each individual in the office begins to play their role too far. I agree with you. That's what, what I, I think. That's why I think that's an embryonic step. I think what's needed is to, you know, open the doors that we've seen that that kind of project shouldn't be done by a single firm. The Santa Barbara, all the newer projects now, we're trying to open the door to bring in lots of players uh, to eliminate that effect. I agree with you very definitely, and I think. Oh, yeah. Because they'll play the game much as your office would. And I think there's a, there's a level. You show the, the pictures you show as, as you know, the piece that you're coming from it has a lot of uniqueness to the parts, but the parts have a commonality. Yeah. Your parts don't have that commonality yet. And I think that that's, there's something that has to be. No, I agree. I absolutely yeah. agree. And that, that's what I was trying to do in the whole sort of opening. Gambit. You know, it's the language. It's this, it's this language issue that I think is yet to be discovered, and it is, and it is. That's the collective effort. I mean, that's where we're we're looking for kindred souls and people to begin to sort of work that one down. That is the real challenge that we are f are confronting and don't really feel we've gotten a handle on it yet. I mean, it is. You know, it's it's beyond us. But you're exactly right. That's the next step to be but it's taken. In the well, it was also temporary. And it's, tra and it's also in its transitoriness. That was a theme that ran through it that these other things don't have. But that's exactly correct in terms of, of the fault of where we're at at this point in time. We sense that very strongly and are, you know, really rapidly, hopefully, moving towards ideas that will, that will, uh, you know, elaborate on that and, and sort of improve it. Yes? One more question. I was uh, recently in San Diego and was able to enjoy Horton Plaza very much. I was wondering, though, if there were any windows of opportunity for a visitor across the city, something like if you consider the Beverly Center here, where they would just remove maybe 10 or 15 shops on the top floor of the food park and give you a vista, a view across the city, whether there might have been any opportunities for a port of Plaza. But what you're missing now, see, there's three more levels that go on top of what you've already seen. So that, and in that case, if you remember the model, where there, that has been, all those axial lines and so forth are all designed to find key points out in the landscape. And then the, what you see today, we thought that the vista south out to the waterfront and so forth was important. And then the invert, there's some wonderful views back to the city down through the main chute, the main axis of the project. We have maybe one more question. No, but it, what you don't, it, it's moving simultaneously. It's going out like a rock, ripple in a rock. And there's projects now that are going out almost in an even spread in both directions. The, the, the big difference is that the Port Authority controls the waterfront, and that's a different set of rules than the redevelopment agency that's controlled the land. So it's a, sort of a out of phase for purposes of this few, these starting years. Um, so it appears to be going towards the convention center, but actually it's going to be a pretty balanced growth in both directions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.